Welcome back, this is Chris. Date today is August 2nd, Year of Our Savior 2016. Bible study number 80. Yes, Bible study number 80. Quite a journey. Yes, we're continuing priestcraft, priestcraft dash introductory rites. Introdu introductory rites, I'll get it. All right, so as we're talking about all this stuff is about a ceremony. It's all about public divine worship. Remember we're talking about Roman Christianity, there's four parts. You got a building, you got the clergy, they're the mediators between God and man. There are the mediators, there are little vicars, there are Jesus. Then you have the mass, those are the, that's us. We just stay in the pew, you just perform what we're supposed to do. And then you have public divine worship. That's the liturgy. You got the procession. You got standing up, sitting down, respond, say this, say that. Lord have mercy on me. Lord up, all that. Sit up, you know, up, down, up, down, up, down, move around. Uh, put your hands in the air. Put your hands down. So this is all about the introductory rites, okay? We're, introdu we're introducing it and then we're moving towards the um because in the chancel area that is where the um the eucharist is going to happen the sacrifice the bloodless sacrifice of jesus but to sacrifice jesus you got we got to they got to transform him transformers more than meets the eye yes you got to move it from the credence stable to the altar where the bloodless sacrifice of jesus christ takes place so it is a, there's a process. So that's what we're talking about. All these different words, there's a reason behind them. All right, so we're talking about the, um, continuing, uh, we have the final reading and high point of the liturgy. Now remember, a liturgy is a right or body of rites, which is a prescribed form governing the words and actions of a ceremony. Prescribe, like a doctor writing a prescription, prescribe for public worship a Eucharistic rite. So we see the liturgy of the word is the proclamation of the gospel. This is preceded by the singing or recitation of the gospel acclamation, typically in hallelujah, with a verse of scripture, which may be omitted if not sung. <clears throat> hallelujah is replaced during Lent, now, Lent is what? What's Lent? Lent is a period of penitence, or penance. Uh, penance is a sacrament in the Roman Catholic Church consisting in repentance or condition of sin, confession to a priest, and absolution. He absolves you. He frees you from guilt of a sin. Okay. Biblically, only Jesus can do that, but there, there are Jesus. They're the vicars of Christ, the mediators. Now, Lent is a, uh, a period of, of um, a fasting observed on the 40 weekdays from Ash Wednesday to Easter in the Roman Catholic Church and some other Christian churches. Now, we see that hallelujah is replaced during Lent by a different acclamation of praise. All stand while the gospel is chanted or read by a deacon or, if none is available, by a priest. To conclude the gospel reading, the priest or deacon proclaims the gospel of the Lord. And the people respond, praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. The priest or deacon then kisses the book. And that's taken from the Roman Missal, the Order of Mass, 16. Now, if a deacon participates, he reads the gospel. If a deacon is not present, the celebrating priest or concelebrant, if there is one, proclaims it. Remember, celebrating is what? To observe a holiday, perform a religious ceremony, to perform a sacrament publicly with prescribed rites. Now you have a con celebrant, which is what? One who celebrates, specifically the priest officiating at the Eucharist. So we're talking about celebrating, and then you have the celebrant, and a con celebrant would be one helping the celebrant or the main dude, okay? So a, a deacon would be helping the priest perform the Eucharist. At least on Sundays and holy days of obligation... A homily, a homily, 
a sermon that draws upon some aspect of the reading of the uh, readings or the liturgy of the day is then given. Now, what are the holy days of obligation? Obligation gives you a clue there. In the Catholic Church, holy days of obligation are days on which the faithful are obliged. What does oblige mean? It means necessary essential or mandatory to attend mass it means hey you got to be there it's obliged it's an obligation it's mandatory so you should call it the holy days of mandatory okay now uh, we also see a homily and uh, homily is a commentary that follows the readings of scripture so they're going to read scripture and they're going to give a commentary and tell you what the bible says because you just need to sit in your pew and listen to whatever the priest says, because he's your vicar. They have it all worked out for you. There's no need to think, folks. All you have to do is chant, participate in the ritualist, the public divine worship. That's what it's designed to do. It's divine, designed to create devotion. And you're a devotee. Mind control. Yes. So ordinarily... The priest celebrant himself gets the homily, but he may entrust it to a con-celebrating priest or occasionally to the deacon, but never, never, ever to a lay person. That is a person that has not gone through seminary, okay? Not qualified. Now, the laity, is they're the ones seated in the nave of the church. In particular cases, and, for a, and uh, for a just cause, a bishop or priest who is present but cannot concelebrate may give the homily. So they're flexible in that case. Now, you see, on days other than Sundays and holy days of obligation or holy days of mandatoriness, uh, the homily, though not obligatory, is recommended. That's taken from the Gurm, paragraph 66. General instruction of the Roman Missal. Now on Sundays and solemnities, now a solemnity is formal or ceremonious observance of an occasion or event, all then profess their Christian faith by reciting or singing the Nicene Creed. Yes. The singing of the Nicene Creed comes from Rome, a profession of faith widely used in Christian liturgy, originally adopted in the city of Nicaea, present-day Iznik, Turkey, by the First Council of Nicaea in 325 AD by Constantine the Great, or especially from Easter to Pentecost, the Apostles' Creed, the Apostles' Creed is an early statement of Christian belief, is widely used by a number of Christian denominations for both litur liturgical and catechetical purposes, most visibly by liturgical churches of Western tradition, including the Roman Catholic Church, Lutheranism, and Anglicanism. Now, I'm not saying I disagree with these creeds, the Nicene Creed and the Apostles' Creed have some good stuff in there. The, my, the basically, the, the issue is, folks, is that you need to go through this priesthood to have access to God. That is, the, that is the concept you have to keep in the back of your mind that, look, you have a choice. You can go through a middleman, which is mankind, which is ultimately going to be controlled by Satan, or you can have direct access, access to Jesus Christ, that your body is the temple, and once you believe through faith, then the Holy Spirit comes into the temple and guides you. Okay, that's the important thing. Now, we see that by reciting the Nicene Creed or the Apostles' Creed, which is particularly associated with baptism and is often used in masses for children, which would be infant baptism. So we see the liturgy of the word concludes with the universal prayer or prayer of the faithful. The priest begins it with a brief introduction, then a deacon, a cantor, or another lay person announces some intentions for prayer to which the congregation responds with a short invocation, such as, Lord, hear our prayer. Now, that's an inv invocation is an invocatory prayer as in the beginning of a service of worship to petition for help, a formula for conjuring, incantation. The priest concludes with a with a longer prayer. 
Now, so the people have their canned prayer, and then the priest ends with his longer canned prayer, okay? Liturgy of the Eucharist. Liturgy of the Eucharist. Now you have the linen corporal. The linen corporal is spread over the center of the altar and the liturgy of the Eucharist begins with the ceremonial placing on it of bread and wine. So we got all the introductory rites. We came in. They got the Bibles. They got the cross. They're singing. They're getting amped up. Okay? And then you have the, the credence table, but now we're dealing with the altar, okay? And now we have the corporal. What is the corporal? You can look that up right in your collegiate dictionary, folks. It's right there. But remember, corporal is also connected to the word corporation. Remember, it's taken from the Latin corpus. It also comes to the, that word corpus. It also forms the word core, like Marine Corps, or the word corpse, or corporal, like your ranking in, in the military, corporal or corporal, which is a linen cloth. So I'm going to read to you out of your collegiate dictionary the word corporal. Corporal, um, archaic of the corporax, from the Latin corpus, from the Latin corpus, which means body, it means dead body is what it really means. And now it is a square white linen cloth, now usually somewhat smaller than the breadth of the altar, upon which the chalice and the paten and also the ciborium. Now the ciborium is a goblet shaped vessel for holding Eucharistic bread. It was originally a particular shape of drinking cup in ancient Greece and Rome, but was later used to refer to a large covered cup designed to hold hosts for and after the Eucharist, thus the equivalent for the bread of the chalice for the wine containing the smaller hosts of the communion of the laity are placed during the celebration of the Catholic Eucharist Mass. All right, so you got the, the, uh, the chalice and the paten. The chalice is obviously for holding what? The wine or the grape juice, right? And then you have the paten, which is going to be the, the crackers or whatever, whatever you use. Use the little discs or whatever. And then you have the ciborium. Now, also a ciborium could be used as a, uh, if you've ever been to St. Peter's Basilica, the ciborium can also be known as called a uh, baldachin, okay, which is that big, huge canopy that is covering the altar in St. Peter's Basilica. I mean, these, these pillars, and I think it's three stories high. So it also can be a uh, canopy covering the altar as well. Okay, it's all relating to the altar. Okay, so we're building the vocabulary as we go along because otherwise you're not going to understand any of this stuff. It's very complex. Now, with this corporal, this linen cloth, where the, where the, the uh, chalice and the paten, this is what holds the bread and wine, which is going to be transubstantiated into Jesus, okay, is spread over the center of the altar. And the liturgy, which is the public formal ceremony of the Eucharist, begins with the ceremonial placing on it of bread and wine. These may, uh, these may be brought to the altar in a procession, especially if Mass is celebrated with a large congregation. Now, a little reference point here, it is praiseworthy practice for the bread and wine to be presented by the faithful. That's your priest, that's taken from the uh, GERM, or General Instruction of the Roman Missal, paragraph 73. The bread, made only from wheat, recently made, and in the tradition of the Latin church, unleavened, and then you have that's from the Gurm, paragraph 320, is placed on a paten. Remember we mentioned paten. What's a paten? Well, a paten or discos is a small plate usually made of silver or gold used to hold Eucharistic bread, which is, which is to be consecrated. It is generally used during the service itself while the reserve sacrament are stored in the tabernacle, which is a receptacle or container from the consecrated elements of the Eucharist in a ciborium, and the wine from grapes mixed with a little water is put in the chalice, 
which is a goblet or footed cup intended to hold a drink in general religious terms is intended for drinking during a ceremony so what you're seeing here is that you have the pat now if, if it's consecrated then what they have is they got a little compartment in the altar where you you put the little you put jesus in there until they're ready you know he might be there a day or so until they're ready to perform the sacrifice okay now and that would be known as a, a tabernacle a tabernacle look this up in your collegiate dictionary is a receptacle or container for the consecrated elements of the eucharist once it's consecrated now we see as the priest places each on the corporal now get a little bit more definition of corporal would be from latin corpor or corpus corpus which means body comes from the doctrine that the bread of the eucharist becomes or represents the body of christ a linen cloth on which the eucharistic elements are placed now as the priest places each on the corporal he says a silent prayer over each one individually which if this rite is unaccompanied by singing he is permitted to say aloud in which case the congregation responds to each prayer with blessed be god forever that's the responses back and forth so he's going to hold up the elements and he's going to do his silent prayer or he's going to be like you know the blood and body of jesus or he's going to do whatever he does and then you're going to respond the congregation goes blessed be god forever you respond back and this is a process of consecrating it this is a big deal big deal folks all right so then the priest washes his hands he wants to wash his hands that's a rite in which the desire for interior purification finds expression just like the pharisees remember they like to wash their hands when they're performing their sacrifice their their ceremony as taken from Gurm, paragraph 78, the congregation which has been seated during this preparatory uh, rite rises and the priest gives an exhortation to pray. This is what they say. Pray, brethren, that my sacrifice and yours may be acceptable to God, the Almighty Father. Okay. Then the congregation responds. It's responsive, responsive, responsive uh, reading or, or stating May the Lord accept the sacrifice at your hands for the praise and glory of his name for our God and the good of uh, good of all his holy church. Okay, then the priest then pronounces a variable prayer over the gifts. Now he prays a gift over it because the priest has the power to make sacred because of the sacrum region folks this goes all the way back to the garden of eden they're the apron priest he has the power to generate to make sacred so he pronounces the variable prayer over the gifts that have been set aside the eucharistic prayer now what is the eucharistic prayer that's the anaphora the anaphora is the most solemn part of the divine liturgy or the holy sacrifice of the mass during which the offerings of bread and wine are consecrated as the body and blood of Christ. The center and high point of the entire celebration. End quote. That's taken from the General Instruction Roman Missal, paragraph 78. Then begins with the dialogue between the priest and the people. That's responsive. This dialogue opens with a normal liturgical or public reading. The Lord be with you. But in view of the special solemnity of the rite now beginning, the priest then exhorts the people, lift up your hearts. The people respond with, we lift them up to the Lord. The priest then introduces the great theme of the Eucharist, which is the priest sacrificing Jesus in a bloodless ceremony a word originating in the greek word for giving thanks let us give thanks to the lord our god he says the congregation joins in the sentiment in this sentiment saying it is right and just the priest then continues with one of many eucharistic prayer prefaces which lead to the sanctus acclamation 
Holy, 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 Lord God of hosts. Heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Now what's the Sanctus? Well, the Sanctus is a hymn from the Chalcedonian, which is relating to Chalcedon, or the uh, ecumenical council held there in 451 AD. So the Chalcedonian is a Christian liturgy, which is a, uh, an ancient Christian hymn closing the preface of most Christian liturgies and commencing with the word Sanctus, 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 or Holy, Holy, Holy. Now, we see here that in some countries, uh, including the United States, the people kneel immediately after the singing or recitation of the Sanctus. Now, the Sanctus, once again, you can verify this in your college dictionary. It's right there. However, the general rule where the Episcopal Conference has not decided otherwise is that they kneel somewhat later. So some, you're going to kneel before, you can kneel a little bit later. Everyone's a little bit different because they all got their little spin on it. Okay? For the consecration, they say the faithful should kneel at the consecration except when prevented on occasion by ill health or for reasons of lack of space or the large number of people present or for another reasonable cause However, those who do not kneel ought to make a profound bow when the priest genuflects after the consecration. So basically, once this becomes once this becomes Jesus, you better kneel, or you better have a good reason. Now, if you're disabled, okay, but you know, use your head down, do something. You got because it's Jesus now. It's God. Kneel before Him, okay. And that's uh, taken from general instruction from the Roman Missal, Gurm, paragraph 43. When according to the Catholic faith, the whole substance, what they are prior to the congregation, consecration of the bread and wine, is converted into that of the body and blood of Christ, which are now inseparable from one another and from his soul and divinity. So now this is soul, divinity, Body, this is the actual body and blood of Jesus. This is Jesus. That's what they say, folks. All right. While the empirical appearances, still a pen, right? But it is actually Jesus. Okay? That's why I call it priestcraft or sorcery. Because sorcery is turning something ordinary into something extraordinary. All right, so while the empirical, uh, which is observation, appearances of bread and wine remain all unaltered, see transubstantiation. That's taken from your online encyclopedia under Mass, Catholic Church. Now, consecration. Consecration means to dedicate by solemn, marked by the observance of established ceremony, specifically celebrated with full liturgical ceremony. So we see uh, that's what solemn means. So we see to consecration means to dedicate by a solemn act to make and declare sacred, specifically to devote irrevocably to the worship of God by a solemn ceremony. So consecration is a very special act of consecrating the bread and wine used in the Eucharist, while according to the Catholic belief involves their change into the actual body and blood of Christ, a change referred to as transubstantiation. The chain, transubstantiation means the change of substance by which the bread and wine offered in the sacrifice of the sacrament of the Eucharist during the Mass become in reality the body, the body and blood of Jesus Christ. Now, the, over and over again, folks, because you bought the lie over and over again, so that's why what we're doing is repetition to deprogram you from Mystery Babylon, because Jesus is saying, look, man, it's late in the game. Come out of her, is what he's saying. He says, come out of Babylon. So that's all I'm trying to do is say, come out of her. I'm imploring you to come out of her, okay? 
I'm not here to judge you. I'm not here. I don't hate anybody, folks. I don't even hate Lucifer. I don't want to carry the hatred. Perfect love casted out all hate. Okay, so the priest as the mediator between God and the people uses his power to make and declare sacred, specifically to make inviolable, inviolable, which means free from violation. You can't turn it back once he does it. Or venerable to revere, worship, or adore. To consecrate the bread and wine, the priest speaks the words of institution. He's speaking his magical incantation. Well, that's not like that, but it gives you, gives you an idea, okay? The words of institution, his incantation, also called the words of consecration, are words echoing, echoing those of Jesus himself at the Last Supper, that when consecrating bread and wine, Christian Eucharistic liturgies include in a narrative of that event. No formula or words of institution in any liturgy is claimed to be an exact uh, reproduction of words that Jesus used, presumably in the Aramaic language at his last supper. So we've got to use the Aramaic language. The formula, so it's a specific formula, but it might vary a little bit, but we got to get that magical formula going on, folks. That's witchcraft, folks. Mm -hmm. you got to get this formula. you got to say it a certain way. The formula is generally combined words from the Gospels of Mark, Matthew, and Luke. Well, it doesn't surprise me. Mixing in Scripture it doesn't surprise me. Just because just you're using Scripture doesn't mean it's right. And the Pauline account in 1 Corinthians 11, 24 to 25, the words of the institution of the Roman Rite are here presented in the official English translation of the Roman Missal. Okay, so we run out of time, folks, but this is all about changing. Okay, it's all about changing everything. Run out of time. God bless you. Stay tuned for more Priestcraft. Jesus loves you. Thank you.